what would we do going through this book if not to end up on the concept of magnetic charge in electrodynamics? What would we do with ourselves? Finally, for the last question, we get to see that through. The statement is, generalize the laws of relativistic electrodynamics, um, where we have the inhomogeneous equations, the homogeneous equations, and the force law to include the magnetic charge. This, of course, is very Griffiths like to do, so I think it's only fair that we start and uh, chop it on through. All right, so much like we had before, uh, we saw that just by putting a charge in there, uh, that this would really just uh, put a emphasis on the magnetic current density with the magnetic charge. So we have to define two different current densities. We have the electric current forward vector as before. This is the one we use all the time, where we have uh, JE mu, okay, E just to denote that it's electric, mu for the fact it's a forward vector, which is C rho E, JE, and the magnetic current analog or analog, the J mu M, where we have uh, rho M for the magnetic charge and the J M for the magnetic density. The fundamental laws are then, well, we see that we have to take the uh, derivatives, okay, the gradients, and then we see that the, uh, the electromagnetic field tensor gives us the electric uh, densities and the dual tensor gives us the magnetic densities. Okay, so where we were homogeneous before, we're now inhomogeneous thanks to the fact that we have a magnetic density. Not too hard of a generalization for those two. However, what we see is that with the force law, we normally had uh, Q uh, E, right, and then we had uh, and then we had Q M for the P stuff. So we have to be careful to add both of them in for the normal. Uh, e and B, and then the uh, dual tensors for E and B as well. Um, again, and then we have to deal with this in the ADA form. So let's actually see how this kind of writes out and move on through. Um, so the first of these reproduces uh, the divergence of E is equal to 1 over epsilon naught rho E, and then we have the curl of B gives us mu naught J E plus mu naught, e, mu naught epsilon naught uh, d e d t, just as before. So the second one, where we attribute everything to the magnetic side, we need to be careful with the dual vector. So we see that the uh, divergence of B is now equal to mu naught c times c rho m, which gives us mu naught rho m, and that's to be expected, right? Uh, same thing, or yeah, this was the Gauss's law for magnetism in the case of the magnetic charge. Then here we go, where we just, again, got to be careful with the one over C's and what's positive and negative with these things. So we get a um, the derivative for B over T term here, the curl of E, and we see that we have the vector of JM here. So if we solve this through and multiply that negative over, we see we get a cancel of C's. Uh, but we still have a negative on the mu naught jm, and then we see that we minus that b uh, derivative over, and these are Maxwell's equations with the magnetic charge, and we've seen that time and time again um, with the uh, um, what am I thinking of with the uh, in chapter seven when we uh, put in the generalized forms. Um, so now we got to look into what the uh, third one says, which if this is the case, or again we're looking for spatial really. Um, you know, if we plug in for the mu equal one, we see what we're getting here. Everything has to be with respect to x, bx, and then plug in the components uh, very carefully. Um, it's not nice or pretty, but it's definitely there. So what this shows out is this compact form, which when we break it down, gives us f equal qe, which we expect here, u cross b plus qm, b and then one over c squared minus u cross e so everything actually does work out fairly well for what we expected um it is just a hot mess to deal with but of course of course of course of course we couldn't finish without trying to put the magnetic charge in there somewhere with how well it fits in everywhere the extension to it is really easy it makes you really weird or worried that we're overlooking something perhaps 
But again, without the imperial evidence or imperial data with this testing, um, we cannot conclude that it is there. And that is a, uh, a wonder for the next generation of physicists. Although based on what we have now, it probably likely that it will never exist, but still a fundamental curiosity based on how well things come together with it. So that being said, I will see you on the next uh, big uh, project. And it looks like we'll head down the quantum mechanics route, except this time we're gonna be a little more specific in what we deal with. Uh, but nonetheless, the foundations will be there and I'll see you then.